so i've been listening to your audios and videos since long and uh in fact in all the discourses there is one thing that i find common this idea of fear right so even in other readings that i have done i see that uh all the religious scriptures including the upanishads and all talk about fearlessness so they very boldly propound the idea of fearlessness and they go to the extent to say that this is the very first quality any seeker requires unless you have an element of courage right you you dare not step on this path in fact we also see that all the religious gurus the mystics they all have this quality in common they all are very courageous about the society and about themselves also so today i want to ask you what is this relationship between fear and freedom like is there any okay so uh fear is basically both physical and psychological so for somebody uh who is poor right he or she fears that uh whether the person would have a house to live in or not so the house in that case would get physical security so in this case fear is about whether my body will be protected or not so let's say that this poor fellow gets get some money becomes rich now the fear is that this house that i have owned in the process of uh, such toil will i be able to own it or not so from physical fear to psychological fear so this journey in which fear is is prevalent so how to get rid of it do we need to get rid of it why is fear such a common element in all the religious discourses there are three things that you have said broadly firstly why is it so that all the religious scriptures talk so much of fear and fearlessness so what is the relation between fear and freedom secondly you have said that how is it so that uh, the seers and the mystics all appear so courageous thirdly you talked of physical versus psychological fear now that's a good lot to begin with okay? let's take this one by one there is no inherent need for any kind of spiritual knowledge or input for a settled and peaceful mind if you are already all right the fact is that you really do not need a spiritual text or a guru hmm or teachings or satsang really they are not needed life is enough yet it has been repeatedly emphasized that spiritual education is extremely important you talked of the upanishads the upanishads give importance to both vidya and avidya but surely place vidya above avidya hmm? so on one hand we are saying that for a still and peaceful mind there is really no need of any kind of education on the other hand we see that the educators themselves have said 
that this education is primary the most important so what does that mean that means that our minds are rarely peaceful and rarely still because chaos noise disturbance is there fear is there so you require a movement towards fearlessness that's all the ultimate aim of all spirituality is that the person the human being should be at peace the feverish condition of the mind vedant refers to it as tapatri the three kinds of agitations mental noise the feverish condition of the mind should be treated all that which makes you restless and causes suffering to you should be ameliorated that is spirituality hmm? the fundamentals basic and simple spirituality is no mumbo jumbo it should be simple joyful feel light that is divinity it is no complex matter hmm a certain straight forward connectedness to oneself and to the universe that is the essence of all religion but if one is wedded to his idea of his self then there is a narrow self concept which excludes a lot of things right. and the lot of things that are excluded in turn become your enemies right. and the thought of harm or possible harm from enemies starts haunting you and you remain unnerved hmm? you remain agitated and if your self concept is strongly tied to your body then looking at your body you see age taking over and you see others dying so you know you too will die yes. so there is obviously the thought of self extinction and that again agitates you these are diseases spirituality is just the cure to diseases otherwise there is nothing special about spirituality a man who is disease free right is already at the center or at the pinnacle right hmm or at the depth of his being whichever word you choose right right so you saying that uh, all the major religious scriptures hmm. when they say that uh, hmm. uh, so they all work under an assumption that this agitation fear they all disease. work under the recognition that man is suffering right not an assumption it is a recognition it's a direct recognition right assumption is held by the illusioned man that he is all right right when you were walking upstairs you saw a poster which said illusion of wellness is the actual disease right so that is an assumption right. that i am all right. right the buddha right is able to see that human life 
ordinary life is just too full of suffering he sees that very clearly and he wants in his compassion to help people get rid of that suffering now why is fear important fear is important because and you must pay great attention to this part fear is the fundamental suffering you may give various names to sufferings you may come up with various types of diseases hmm? greed envy possessiveness right. this and that ambition violence self pity a thousand things but at the center of all diseases sits fear that is why fearlessness is so important and essential in spirituality so what have we said so far we are saying spirituality is about the alleviation of human suffering right and second point human suffering is centrally fear so spirituality and fear are very intimately connected right right spirituality and fearlessness right are very intimately connected right now what is it that we are afraid of right one is afraid of nothing except extinction obliteration is what unnerves us so much being existing is our nature thought of extinction is against your nature extinction says you are no more the fact of your being is that you cannot go away right now there is a conflict right right you simply do not like the idea of not being you can never like the idea of not being because being is your nature who is this you that we are talking about is this the patient no the one who is fearful no this you is the totality of being which includes the fearful one which includes the fearful one right. but the fearful one includes only himself in it right and that's why and excludes so everybody else everything else you see totality includes the fragment right but for the fragment his self concept does not include totality right getting it so i know that i don't even know it is ingrained in me it is there in my dna and it is beyond my dna that i am but everything every situation around me is constantly telling me i will be no more and the fact is not only will i be no more after x number of years i am losing a bit of me every moment this makes one nervous what was yesterday is not today what was today morning is not right now so death is already coming in installments are you getting it right 
you'd be able to now see why we are so eager to accumulate because accumulation makes us feel secure against extinction extinction means i am contracting and eventually i will be no more accumulation means i am expanding inflating we feel it is some kind of a guarantee against death that is why people collect money that is why people collect relationships that is why people want to collect respect anything that you want to collect is actually a kind of mental defense against death fundamental fear is of death death meaning extinction no being no more no no insecure mind seeing so many things outside of itself hmm? because it has a narrow self concept and it has put everything else outside of itself wants to take more and more from the world thinking that having taken more it will live longer it will continue further in time hmm? there is no suffering except fear and there is no fear except the fear of extinction one may say that he is afraid of a lizard one may say that he is afraid of losing his job one may say that he is afraid of prices increasing in the market but at the root of all these fears is still the fear of extinction can you pick up an example like for instance because if the loses, prices increase right. what will eventually happen what does a price increase remind me of what does it remind me of prices would increase i'll have to spend more let's say hmm. that my expenses would increase the prices increase further what happens right, right? i would become poor maybe then increase further right i would starve then then i would die inside right. so the price increase right. somewhere right you know activates the memory of right of you with you becoming extinct yes right. you becoming extinct right. the lizard right the lizard right now you have come from a process of evolution right hm and you were a bird once mm-hmm. and there was this huge dinosaur hm the great 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 uncle of the lizard and you were gobbled up by the dinosaur and the lizard reminds you of your painful death and probable death right do you see this right. and of course not to forget snakes of all kinds of which only 5% might be poisonous right. but see how you freak out on looking at a snake and the poor lizard is hardly interested in attacking and the poor right. lizard is hardly even the snake is hardly interested in attacking even if it does attack we know that an overwhelming majority of them are harmless right. yet you know how we simply lose our mind on looking at snakes it can also be a kind of a cultural creation right in culture you you ascribe certain images to certain creatures for instance snakes are harmful yes, yes right so it can be more cultural than psychological yes yes in can cases be. it is quite cultural for instance one would never be fearful of a cow right and one would be fearful of a bull right right, right. well so, said well said so so in parts it can be social conditioning also right. but a large part of it is ingrained in you biologically even the little kid has the instinct of self preservation it does not want to die it wants to live hmm death is something that even the newborn does not want right so there is nothing social about it right right hmm right 
nothing social about it even the newborn wants to protect its body that is there so it may not know the snake the snake may be a cultural introduction the fear of the snake may be a cultural introduction but if it goes close to the snake and the snake does scare the child let's say the snake gives a harmless nip to the child right. which is not poisonous right just a little nip right the child will not again go to the snake right nothing social about it right. just the instinct to avoid pain and death and preserve the body and continue in time which is very much biological which is very much biological right but a lot of it later on can be social surely right and you are saying that with with in fear this biological element it overwhelms and it becomes in you know, the process the psychological as well when the reaction is coming right then the biological and the social are anyway interacting with each other leading to one consolidated reaction at that moment that that point in time it is impossible to determine what is what of course hmm? you are angry at somebody at that moment it is one wave of anger you cannot dissect it in two components biological and social right. the biological and the social have reacted leading to an explosion right. hmm? biological social along with the external stimulus right. so there is the body then there is the thought and then there is the external condition right. these three have gotten together and there is an explosion right. now i cannot segregate the explosion into two or three parts right. so that is this thing now coming to mystics right and you talked about their courage right no mystic is ever courageous you see courage has any sense or meaning only in the presence of fear in the presence of fear courage becomes a meaningful word mystics are not courageous they simply lack fear in their inner completeness they have no thought that something is probably going to be lost and fear is this thought what is fear the thought that something might be taken away from me i might reduce right. that's what we said right extinction right. extinction is the last point right. and reduction is the process of extinction the mystic has already reduced to the last point he has nothing left to lose now how can he be afraid anymore you are afraid only when you have something to lose the mystic has willingly dropped everything what is left to lose so he has no sense of fear as such right he knows that if he is carrying something and if somebody snatches it away right. it will be no more with him right. he knows this he is not an idiot right. but there is hardly any attachment of his self worth his sense of being his fundamental identity to what he is carrying in his hand so even as you come to snatch this away from my hand i will know that you are coming to take it and if this happens to be important for a purpose and that purpose will always be a limited purpose right. not really uh, having a bearing upon who i am my my, my sense of existence hmm? i will know bearing upon that so you come to take it away right. i will know that there is going to be a loss if you take it away right but that loss is not going to make me fearful right hmm so you saying that the whole idea the whole conception of courage hmm is a conception of the fearful it is a conception of the fearful and unfortunately it 
preserves and furthers the fearful. Okay. Our culture, you know, and the various cultures that we see around us. Not only culture, the very foundation of civilization itself places great value upon facing fear. And what we call as facing fear is not really about realizing what fear is, but about taking a tough position against fear. Right. So in the process, we make fear an enemy right. and we train our guns against fear right. and this training of guns against fear is what we call as courage. Right. So fear has come and fear is my enemy and I'll attack and obliterate fear and that is what I call as courage. The mystic is not courageous. For him, there is no enemy called fear. Whom would he attack? But why does that not work, that methodology of objectifying fear, making it concrete? Because objects themselves are fear. Right. You know, the more you live in the world of objects, the more you are attached to objects, the more importance objects hold for you the more afraid you will be because it is the nature of objects to be impermanent. Right. And fear is the very thought of impermanence. Mm. I look at this wall right. and if this wall becomes very dear to me, mm. every dent in the wall would hmm? be a dent in your heart. Would be a dent in my heart. Are you getting it? Right. So, a relationship with this world full of objects is a relationship of fear. So you are saying that one has no choice but to be fearful because because one has no choice but to live in the objective world. Objects are around. You know, it's a special quality of living to live in the objective world, right. to live in the world full of objects right. and yet not become one of the objects. Right. So to okay right. So to link this last statement of yours to, to, to the first point from which we began. So can I say that this is what spirituality tells you, like this is yes. this. well said. Right. This. So you know, we take great pleasure in saying that these are objects right. and I am the subject that is watching the objects. Right. The fact is the subject has no choice but to be another object. You may secure yourself or redeem yourself by telling the, yourself that you are in, you are the subject. Right. Fact is, the subject is just another object. For some other subject. No, even for yourself. Right, how? How do you look at your body? Like from my sense organs, when I, when I look at a mirror. How do you look at this camera or this wall or those pictures or that television? How do you look at these and things? These sense organs give me an input, right? Is there any difference between the way you look at those things and this thing? We got the wall painted, you got a new shirt. Right. Right. Hmm? Right. Is there a difference? Really a difference, except a deeper sense of attachment. You have a deeper sense of attachment to your bones and flesh right. and eyes and hair right. and shirt. Right. Then you have with the wall. So, okay, so let's go one step further. Let's say that there's a doctor, right? Mm. A doctor clearly uh, has become aware of the fact that the body is impermanent and this body of mine is nothing but just another object, right? So what about this doctor? How is... This, this doctor is aware there's perhaps no difference between this fist and this camera. So this, this doctor, what, what about this doctor? This doctor is a subject in itself. It sees that no body it has it is clearly realized that the body is is just another object so what that which is not the body in the doctor can we at least call that a subject hmm, the, 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 the one who realizes right, right. realization right. is not the same right. as ordinary sensual perception 
there is something in the doctor that is realizing. Go close to that word. There is something that is realizing that I am not really very different from the earth under my feet. I am not really different from the air that I breathe in. I am not really very different from the clay pot. Right. Now when you are realizing this, then something quite important is realized, which is, you look at all these objects, and you also look at that object which is giving rise, birth to all these objects. You went to the point that he looks at the wall and he looks at his body and he says both are objects. But where are both of these objects sitting? In some subject in another object. That object is called mind. Right. But but mind is a subject for the mind objects. is a subject for these objects. For these objects. Right. Right. So in realization the subject is also seen mm. in a way which is different from the way the subject looks at the object. Right? When the subject looks at the object, then the subject says, I have a relationship with that object. In the sense that, in some way or the other, your identi identities depend upon every single object that you see. But there is a way of seeing in which you see this, you see this, and you look at your mind, very, very not being connected in any way. It has been called witnessing. It is also very similar to detachment. And this links us to fearlessness. It links us to this fearlessness. This whole art of not identifying with the objective world. We're not identifying. Till the time anything in this world hmm, right. is really and seriously important to you. Right. You will live in fear. Right. You want to check whether or not you are going to live in fear? Just apply this test. If there is anything of this world which is of tremendous importance to me, I will live in fear. Of the first importance must be something else. The world must always have a lower priority, the second priority. Till the time the world or a part of the world has the first priority, you are condemning yourself to fear. And that is where the mystic scores. Right. He lives in the world, but his first priority is not the world. He has known what the world really is. His priority lies elsewhere. That doesn't mean that he ignores the world or, you know, right. he participates. But his participation is not that of somebody whose self-definition is linked to the participation. Hmm? And this, this makes me uh, think of a story that is, and, and also how this detachment, which, which you are saying it results in fearlessness, this detachment has been conceived of, especially in India, as indifference, right? Inert indifference, that you do not, so for instance, if you are not identified with your house, 
so if it if it's burning down what you do is you just sit and say oh, it's not my house and all that oh. so the mystic also runs when his house is getting burnt all he does says is that i mean i won't die it is the body that is that will i'll die. put it a little differently right. the mystic does not prevent his body from running when the house burns you don't have to run when your house burns your body will run you just don't get stubborn and idealistic and stop your body i am a holy man how can i run so body stop now the body has no choice but to obey the command of the mind till a point at least so the body will have to stop otherwise leave physical things to the body the body knows the body knows when it needs calories it will ask for food the body knows when what it has taken in needs to be excreted right the body will give you signals right the body knows when it is out of fuel right right so then discharge will say i want sleep right you don't unnecessarily bother the body you don't unnecessarily impose your identity based thoughts upon the body the body has its own mechanisms its own intelligence it will it will know what to do so can we say this for all the objects or as well like the yes, of the course existence? yes of course so just as the body knows what to do right. this entire universe knows what to do right this huge system knows what to do right, right. you don't really have to bother you don't really have to come in like a superman right. and rescue it right. there is no need to rescue the world there is no need to do anything great system knows what to do in fact complications arise when you start trying to do something special for example not running away when your house is burning is something quite special right. and one may try to do that right yeah these are fanciful things right. you will get a lot of respect if you try that right. and i'm sure people along with a few burns person. maybe right. you may get a few boils here and there but you will be revered as a holy man if you do not run away when your house is burning you are inside the house right hmm so man tries to do special things there is no need to do anything special everything is ordinary everything is as per a cosmic order which takes care of itself when you do not realize that order and when you are not in sync with that order then you call that order as a chaos it is never a chaos the universe knows its own harmony so if i were to like literally put all that we have talked about up till now in a nutshell so we began by addressing this question what is the relationship between fear and freedom now how do we see that all the mistakes the religious scriptures they they talk about fearlessness so bravely and we have covered uh, basically two two points firstly you said that uh, uh, when you identify with the objective world it is then you become fearful right so uh, the object is not the not something to be prioritized there is something else which calls for your priority and we haven't yet uh, opened up that dimension right and you also saying that the mistake is not courageous i mean the courage is a conception exists for the fearful it's a right. it's a it's a concept in duality it's a concept so there is fear and to obscure fear to turn your face away from it Right. Hmm? Right. or to pretend to yourself that you are up to the challenge you come up with the thought of fearlessness right. that is courage right. courage is just the imagination of fearlessness the mystic does not think that he is fearless he is actually fearless and being fearless means there is no fear when there is no fear 
what is the need of courage right right which also means that the mystic is not attached identified uh, to the objective world the mystic is identified has its his or her self identity ascribed to something else of some other dimension which is not an object which is not an something object. else which is not really an object which is not an object right so uh uh if i were to ask you like what is that dimension because man incessantly is is activity right so you're saying that it, uh, so we have arrived at this point that fear is basically about the objective world and once you have become so identified with the objective world that that this gap diminishes right you become the object and when you become the object since the nature of the object is to with is to de- get the in time in time yes, right yes. so since you have become the object it is it is quite natural that you also will feel fearful because the object is going to die in some time so and you are saying at the same time that you have to turn your i somewhere else so if i were to like ask you because man is activity right you cannot tell us to not to identify with something activity has to happen consciousness has to go somewhere so if not the object then what if not this world then which world right this is no there, there is no other world right there is only this world since you said this world ha huh. but i didn't say there is another world right. there is just this world hmm huh? if i am saying don't be identified with this world right. that is not the same as saying be identified with another world i am not saying that i am just saying that be cautious of what this world is about what is this knowing of this world there is this world there is this world we all agree right hmm? right as we are mortal bodies right. we are sitting on this chair the chair is resting on the earth huh hmm. there is this world right. undeniably right a fact right <clears throat> now this world can either be lived in in a idiotic way not knowing what it is right. or one can live intelligently in it knowing fully well what it is don't you think there is a difference in these two kinds of living there surely is yes. there surely is yes. right right now is this difference coming from this world wait look at the question again there is this world right. there is this world right. huh right you can either sit here in attention knowing intelligently what this whole thing is hmm what i am saying to you hmm what is the meaning of listening right what does it mean to be related to me right to be related to all the people here right huh right. really knowing right really knowing right no you're here right and you are a ball of attention hmm you you are like a candle hmm that is one way of living the world is around you and you are living like a candle so you are able to see everything in your own light right 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 light that is emanating from within you in that light you are able to look at everything hmm that is one way you know what i am saying then right. then you know how to listen then you know how to love and how to be intimate and how to have relationships you know everything hmm and there is another way of living right what is that another way of living right. hmm the other way of living is that of the drunkard the man half asleep the man only half conscious the man only half alive hmm and no idea of what is happening or let me say lots of ideas about what is happening he is simply just too full of ideas hmm thoughts thinking of fairy tales traveling to fairy lands right just not here right my question to you is for these two is the world objectively different now assume those two people are here right hmm right for these two is the world objectively different 
the world is different for these two this much you understand do we see that the world is a different place for these two the world is surely a different place for these two is this difference coming from the world no. from where is this difference coming from attention perhaps and is attention, attention a part of the world attention. No, so no. is attention a part of the world no had he been a part of the world the drunkard would have also been attentive right because the drunkard yes 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 i get you he could have taken a pill from the world something right. to make him more attentive right. so there is the world and even to know this world to live in this world there must be something which is not of this world that is what i am calling as more important than the world itself right. which has the power to make you fearful right or fearless i mean right which has the power to which has the potential and that is the candle in which fear like literally burns off right the candle of attention right that flame that flame about which upanishads talk about that flame which you witness in the eyes of the seers and the saints right and you have to remember that nothing in this world can give it to you absolutely nothing in this world can give that to you but in light of that you can know this world very clearly and be free from fear of this world are you getting it right. you get the relationship between that and this world right the world may try its best but it can never give that to you because it does not have it it does not have it had it had it it, it is not the property of the world to have it right. Hmm? right the world simply cannot have it you may try extracting it from the world many people try that right. many people want love from the world for example right. Right. they think that you know at some time at some place from some person they can get love right you cannot get it from here this does not have that right. It's it is somewhere else right, right. and that somewhere else is not a place in the world right it is not a geography right you cannot put your finger on that right. it's not an object it's not an object right. hmm so world cannot give it to you but if you have that if you are with that then the world becomes a different place the candle is shining things are clearer right life is brighter right right all of this seems so like so beautiful but the question that's troubling me is what about the drunkard right because you began by telling us that the upanishads say two things firstly they say that i mean their recognition is that all of our drunkards drunkards exist and in large number right the those attentive people with flames shining are rare right and that is why they talk about being fearless right because the recognition is that drunkards are in large numbers so let's talk about that drunkard because this image is so beautiful to me also so let's say that i am a drunkard so how do i become that flame because because uh, even before this discussion with you we were talking about uh, in the group that two things exist fear and the desire to be fearless right yes, drunkard wants to be all right so drunkard never likes like being drunk let's take the story a little backwards right why is the drunkard a drunkard what brings him to the drink okay i can see it yes but you talked of the desire to be fearless right. do you see the relationship between that and being more fearful the desire to be fearless if not handled correctly will make you more fearful what does the drunkard want the drunkard wants freedom from tension and suffering hmm after a long chaotic day 
heavy upon him. Right. What does he want? He wants a light mind. But he does not know how really to get that lightness. The only recourse that he has is get a drink. Or buy love. Watch or buy love or watch a movie. movie or or love. Love. Some kind of entertainment, some kind of escape. Right. Courage. Courage. Right. Go and engage in a brawl. That is another entertainment. And these things the objective world can give you. Oh, they, they are all this much. Escape it can surely give you. It cannot give you uh, love. But it can give you bought love. Hmm? So, we all have it. A deep realization that we belong to intelligence, that we belong to the highest state of mind possible. Everybody knows that peace is valuable. Seen anybody who does not want peace. You go to the most violent man, ultimately when he wants peace. So we all know that, that these are the most important things and these are the states that we want to reach. It's just that if we are not attentive to the journey back to the center, then instead of going back to the center, we drift further away from the center. So the drunkard, wanting relief from tension, ends up creating more tension for himself and for the world. What did he want? In, in buying a drink, what did he want? Peace. He may say that he wanted excitement or titillation or whatever. But the fact is, he wanted peace. He wanted freedom from the chaos of thought. Hmm? But because the route that he chose was chosen in inattention, it resulted in furthering, the furthering that same disease that he wanted to be cured of. Hmm? So, what are we left with, finally? It means diseased we are, just as Upanishads say. And it is no point going back and back and back and trying to see what caused it. Because when we are going backwards into the drunkard's life, we see that a little bit of drunkenness leads to greater drunkenness and such things. And ultimately, you would still be asking, what leads to that first iota of drunkenness. There is no hence point. If we are to come to see what probably is a solution, the solution is there is always a choice. You may be a little drunk or you may be deeply drunk. But you always have a choice. The drunkard is returning from his office, not yet drunk, but stressed. And there comes a moment when he decides, I am going to the bar. He had a choice in that moment. It's not as if that was a totally mechanical and predestined choice. There was a choice involved and where there is a choice involved then that choice can either be in your best self or as 
or in your identity as a drunkard. So even as you are sitting here, every moment there is a choice involved. Any moment you can decide to switch off. All these members of the audience also. Any moment they can decide to switch off. And any moment they can decide to come back. That is the thing about our nature. We are internally so powerful that the choice to reach the highest stage is always there with us. Such is our power. Exercise that choice wisely. Let the best in you make decisions on your behalf. Hmm? I would say refrain from making decisions. There is something within you that you may be quite unfamiliar with. But that thing is the best in you. It is quite unlike what you look. It does not have the same face as you have. It probably does not have a face at all. But still, it is quite intimate, very near to your heart. Let that thing, let that best self, let that decide on your behalf. You step back. This stepping back is called surrender. I will let that act on my behalf. And just as we were talking a little while back, even that best self does not come from the world. Of course. Yeah. This surrendering yields fearlessness spontaneously. Does it? Mm, it's cyclical. So the more fearless you are, okay. the more ability you have to surrender. That is another misconception. People think that the one who is afraid surrenders. The fact is, you cannot surrender without being greatly fearless. A little bit of fearless, a little bit of surrender. With actually no surrender at all. But with that little bit of surrender, you gain a little bit more of fearlessness. So more, 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 more. So largely we have talked about two kinds of things amidst which we have placed fear, right? The objective world and let me use a new word and call it something mystical, right? Something of which one has no idea, something which surely does not belong to the objective. But world. in light of which, right? you can look at, evaluate and know the reality of all ideas, right? you know? You can have no idea of that, but if that blesses you, if that touches you, then you will know what this thing called idea is. And if that does not bless you, then ideas, instead of remaining just ideas, will become your dominant masters. Which has become the case in the world. Which is the case in the world. This We have a world which is being run by ideas and thoughts. And not by that right. best self. Right. And perhaps these drunkards can be helped, cured only in the light of that candle. Only in the light of that candle, yes right. of course. So, you know. You want to do something about that drunkard? Yeah, surely. Cross his way. You know, the way the drunkard is. Somebody reminds him of the drink, of wine or whiskey. Hmm? 
something or somebody. There is always some external stimulus which prompts him to turn to the bar. Now you too can cross his way. Just as there is somebody who guided, rather misguided, the drunkard towards the bar. Similarly, if you just exist, I'm not saying you go and teach him. I'm saying you cross his way. Maybe by just looking at your face, he'll drop the idea of drinking. You won't even know you have helped him. The drunkard is saying, this world is not worth living in. The drunkard is saying, everybody is already drunk. Let me be a little more inebriated. And he just cross his way. That might be sufficient. But first you have to be somebody who reminds others of that. The presence has to be enough. Your eyes have to shine with a light that is not coming from this world. Your voice must carry a ring which is not of this world and you cannot fake it and you cannot bring it through practice or rehearsals. We are not talking about eye gloss here. We are talking about something which can really prevent a drunkard, which can really make him change his course. Not that he preached, just that he forgot that he had planned to drink. Something else, more important, just occurred to him. Oh, something else is more important. Something else deserves a higher priority. And later on, by the time he recalls that he needed to drink, he discovers that the bar is closed. <laughs> All right, the bar is closed, the day is gone, the threat has been stopped. So the drunkards need those attentive flames, right? Those flames of attention, those people. We all need those, right? For ourselves first. Right. right. And this is what the Upanishads, the texts, the gurus are, right? The third thing you talked about, right. the difference between the physical and the psychological aspects of fear. You know, you see, fear is fear. It doesn't matter whether you feel afraid of an approaching bus, or lion, or tank, yes. or whether you feel afraid when you start imagining about something. One kinds of feel justified in saying that if the fear is psychological then it is something absurd because you are just imagining but if the fear is physical then the fear is justified okay. hmm? at least somewhat justified we want to claim that we want to say that if there is actually a lion in front of me then I am justified in being afraid. No, not even in this case. Fear is fear. When a lion is really in front of you, 
where is the time to be afraid you do you really have time to be afraid if you have a lion in front of you what will you do with fear use it to hit the lion i have never heard that fear was used to scare away a lion no lion is afraid of your fear if anything your intelligence can save you from the lion not your fear run climb a tree disappear whatever you can do act as if you have a gun right and i think this thing that you said is is is, is something that we all are perhaps aware about that fear is something completely unnecessary so i do not require it right it's completely unnecessary and yet we are not able to get rid of it so we all understand ki that it comes from the way we live right you see what happens is fear presents itself to our consciousness by way of thought only when there is a particular opportunity a particular threat at other times we claim i am not afraid right so 23 hours a day what do we claim no i'm all right i'm all right no fear one hour a day what do we claim oh i'm afraid the fact is that 24th hour is very closely related to these 23 hours in fact we are afraid all the time it is just that in the 24th hour the fear showed up the fear rose above the surface like an iceberg and showed up some part of it but it was always present always always present not only was it always present it was always in the making fear comes from the way we live you know i will say i went to the office and when i came to learn that i might get a pink slip then i was gripped by fear but the fact is you are afraid of being sagged because two days back you have received a letter from the developer of your new house and he is demanding another 40 lakhs from you are you getting it what have i received what have i just received i am purchasing my third house and the developer has sent me a letter saying pay me 40 lakhs more right and two days later what do i get i'm not yet received the pink slip right don't tell fine me <laughs> just the possibility great fine rumors in the office people are being fired you know and i start shivering in my trousers why because right in the morning along with the breakfast my wife served me the credit card bill do you see how fear is related to my entire lifestyle i have a wife who keeps shopping 48 hours a day <laughs> oh. <laughs> she stuffs in twice the amount in every hour now with this kind of a wife will i not be afraid of being sacked in the office tell me yes so do you see that how the 24th hour is related to the 23 hours fear comes from the very way you live hmm somebody is appearing for an and the corporate example because that's fair right somebody is appearing for an interview a young man 
yet he appears so nervous. Where is this fear coming from? Where is this fear coming from? The fear is coming from the fact that his entire life he has been brought up on expectations of return. Parents have a definite expectation that the son is going to offer them returns. Now, the son has been thoroughly conditioned. The son has been told that your obligation in life is to pay back your parents. If he doesn't get this job, what face is he going to show to mama? This one moment of fear is coming from 25 years of conditioning. Fear doesn't strike you in a vacuum. Are you getting it? If you are a victim of fear, know that there is something wrong about the way you live. Instead, what happens is people come and ask, and I often been asked this question, what to do when you are afraid? Now you cannot do anything when you are afraid. What to do when faced with a lion? Bake a pasta. Or a pizza. What kind of answer do you expect? Right. Hmm? Play ice hockey. Right. This is one of your metaphors only you quote it, you quote this very often, right? So a person with a heart attack and <laughs> then you ask him to jog only then. In the moment of heart attack, are you going to jog? Right. Now what to do when I'm faced with fear? Do whatever you want to. Everything is as good or as bad as the other. Right. Somehow let that moment pass. What else can be done? Right. The, but you will never ask how to live a life in which fear is not the necessary output. You will never ask that because in living that life, your ego is challenged. Right. Your, all your patterns are broken. You will say, we want to live the kind of life we are living, yet we want to not to get those paranoid attacks of fear. Right. So give me courage, right? Hmm. Give, me, give me courage. Give me courage. Give me some kind of a medicine or a vaccine which can take care of things. You are saying I want to let the disease simmer inside me and yet I don't want to have fits of fear. Now you are carrying the disease inside you. Right. Once in six months fits are going to appear. But you don't want to treat the disease. Your life is the disease. Your mind is a disease. You talked of the Upanishads, that's how we started. Does any Upanishad ever say, these are the mantras, right. recite them at the time of fear and thou shalt be fearless? Right. Have you ever seen anything kind of kind this kind? No. The Upanishads take you close to the fear. Like Yamraj taking Nachiket close to death. And now the young man has learned what life is and how to live. Right. In, in this now, uh, I can clearly see how this point of yours that it's not a particular coordinate it's not about a particular moment when you're fearful. It's also it's also about the all the coordinates that has resulted in that coordinate, all the moments. So this makes me uh, refer back to the last section of our discussion where we are talking about the drunkard and that flame, right? That flame of attention. So even here, attention is the solution to fear, right? That you have to be attentive in each moment. You can't just wake up and ask, like, 
now i am uh, in which each moment, moment right? moments in which fear does not appear to be there the so called normal moments of life you are walking with your friend hmm chatting with your wife hmm looking up to your boss phoning in front of your parents these are the moments where you should know what you are doing so it seems that that fear is precisely a disease of this world by this world i mean the objective world and i don't mean some other world in contrast to this so fear resides precisely in the mind and mind is made up of objects oh. right so so the only solution or at the only cure that exists is that you identify not with the objects but you become something other than the object right that that you know you know this talk of otherness was just to make a point okay. rather exemplify something right. whenever you will talk of the other to somebody whose mind is infested with objects he will turn the other into an object so don't talk of the other okay, okay. that was just for your consumption okay okay hmm? talk of knowing this world very clearly this knowing is the other okay right i said in the light of the candle you know the you know the the world the world candle. this candle is the other right right are you getting it this candle is the other so just talk of knowing the world itself know how you are living know what is hiding inside the mind watch your small actions daily responses take an example a man is walking and you approach him from behind and just tap his shoulder is he likely to think that it's an angel or a well wisher or a friend how does he react usually he gets scared he gets scared he right he might get attacked and he might get attacked right now that shows you what one's conception about the world always is that the world is a hostile place right. and the world means objects right. whosoever lives in the world always lives under a shadow of threat that's why the moment you tap a man from behind he starts feeling scared have you ever seen somebody waiting to be tapped from behind and especially if it's a deserted street in the night and you didn't hear any footsteps either and yet you have been tapped hmm he's already scared <laughs> try waking up him in the morning and you will know what fear is and how it lives even in the sleeping mind you know our friend here when you try to wake him up in the morning he wakes up with a very dramatic start who is it who touched me what has happened who is dying where is the fire what just came down what just exploded that's the kind of response he gives and he has been sleeping so even in the sleeping mind fear is still there do not think that fear is brought to you by particular situation hmm what is the use when krishna says that to avoid fear two conditions are necessary brahma i am uh, i 
these two conditions dainam na palayano how this helps prevent fear these two are actually one when you think of yourself as a small that is called deenta when you think of the other as big you want to run away that is called palayan but these two are actually one na dhanyam means no self pity no self pity you are not small na palayanam means don't run away from the situations because the situations are not bigger than you these two mean the same thing essentially what they mean is you are so big that the external does not mean anything and ultimately you are so big that there is no external at all what appears like the external is all within you no obviously nadanyam na palayanam is a recipe wonderful recipe for fearlessness so it is not about that other world as much as it is about this world of course world. in fact one should avoid talking about that other world or something as much as possible because given what we are we will always misinterpret we will always misunderstand so can i also go to the extent and say that it is not as much about fearlessness as it as it is about fear only very well right. said that knowing have... fear is fearlessness right very well said because fearlessness in itself is nothing is nothing is an is a in fact that, that great nothingness is fearlessness right. right that great nothingness in which fear is not there is is fearlessness so you have to be completely attentive to the drunkard Com- don't bother about the well, flame, right? well said well said because all you have the drunkard right yes yes all that you have is this world and thoughts and fears and identification go close to them right don't live in a utopia right don't live in a dreamland right, right. go close to this world see what this this and this are and i also in 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 almost all of your uh, articles and discourses this, this is one the, this is almost the substratum this is one thing that you repeatedly argue and you say and this is one thing with which you have lot of problems you say you you say that this is the misreading that has happened misreading of the text misreading of the rishis misreading, misreading of the mystics that you have tried to make the flame an object yes, yes so so better we not talk out talk about the flame watch we we must be concentrated on the drunkard yes, because yes. that is all we have yes right? yes yes if we start talking about the flame yes. we make it a drunkard yes. that is you what we do you see there was this frog right frog right hmm right and a frog is a frog does not look really quite pretty and then came a prince hmm and it is said that just the glance of the prince turned the frog into a beautiful princess but the special thing was that the prince bothered to glance at the frog was the prince looking at the frog in the moment of glance was the prince looking at the frog or dreaming of the princess looking at the frog looking at the frog right the world is that frog don't dream of the princess look clearly and sharply at this frog and once you look clearly and sharply at this frog you might discover a princess sure. but there is no use fascinating about the princess if you will keep dreaming about the fr- princess you will miss the frog and the frog is the princess are you getting it so don't think about that that is contained in this the frog is the princess he does not exist somewhere else he is here but if you think of him you will miss him but if you are present to this you will get him go close to the frog and what do you get the frog or the princess 
Once you go close to the frog, what do you get? The frog or the princess? princess. The princess. And you cannot get the princess in any other way. There is no way to get the princess. I didn't. The frog appears. Dirty. Ugly. <laughs> a frog is a frog. But that dirty frog is the princess. Watch out. Yeah. And that frog, right? That that frog to that the frog has to what what the frog can do? The frog has to allow the prince to do its work. The frogs right? frogs don't bother. You can you can go close to them as close as you want to. No, but these frogs are always imagining about the princess. These frogs have been told. That frogs princess, or the or the prince or the prince. The prince knows the princess, right? The prince knows the princess. Mm. But these frogs, what, what's happening is that the prince walks in, right? But the prince cannot create an effect on the frog. Why? Because the frog is lost. The frog is not just the frog. The frog has read books about the fact that a frog is not just a frog. It can become a princess and stuff. Huh. So the frogs are imagining about princes, princesses. And that is why even when the prince walks, the prince prince throws a gaze at them, nothing happens. Don't you think this is the case also? You see, in the eyes of the frog, the prince is just another frog. Just as the prince has to look sharply at the frog, the frog also has to look sharply at the prince. And when the frog looks sharply at the prince, then suddenly the prince turns into a female frog. Prince, which it always was. What do you think? There is a frog? No. There is only a princess. That in inattention, in illusion, looks like a frog. So, in the absence of attention, everything is a frog. Look at it sharply, it's a prince or a princess. There is no frog and there is no prince really. You know, we, we, we narrated that story when I did narrate it, from the point of view of the prince. Hmm. Take the story to the frog. What does the frog see coming? Another frog. Another frog. But when the frog looks sharply at this another frog, is the other frog, what does it get? A prince. Are you getting it? Yes. Looking sharply, knowing, realizing, that is the key. And that is the key towards fear. or maybe there is no towards as such there is no it's the same thing it's the same thing right going close to fear makes you fearless don't and you require about. fearlessness to go close to fear right. so no point asking what comes what first, first. there is no linearity as such right so i think more or less our questions have been answered and it was a beautiful journey exploring with you the, the the very dimensions of what fear is right thank you okay thank you so, uh, i have seven questions when you were saying that those 23 hours of the day are very important to uh, make, to have the those 23 hours of the day are the ones where you can be attentive because when you are in fear then the choice moment you don't have that much choice but 23 hours of the day, you have that choice. So, when a person is attentive, I, I want to know what is exactly at being attentive because thought of attention is not attention. And attention is of is something of the beyond. So, one can only surrender to what is happening. It is actually very simple. Convincing yourself that you know is not the same as knowing. Thinking that you know is not the same as knowing. Hmm? Let me give you a very present example. Often after I have spoken, then some of you try to jot down the important points and you mail them across to others, sometimes even to me. And often what you have written is just not 
what I had said or what we had discussed. Hmm? And the mistake is extremely obvious. Yet, at that moment, when you were listening, you convinced yourself that you know. What is it to really pay attention? It is to honestly ask oneself, do I know? Have I understood? Have I gotten to the roots of it? Do I really know or am I just accepting? That is attention. Do I really know honestly? Do I know or am I just sitting here? See. Has it really permeated me? Or is it just a vague idea floating around my mind? Hmm? Attention is that. And that asking, do I really know? It's a very fine quality. You do not stand at a place verbally asking yourself, do I know, do I know? It's a very fine quality. You know, even a child realizes when he does not know. Have you seen how curious they are? They'll ask something and they get an answer and they're not happy with the answer. They ask again and again, how does the child know that he needs to continue questioning? Because he has a sense that he has still not grasped the matter fully. We all have that sense. That is what I am calling as an inner honesty. We all know that the matter is not fully clear. Yet, out of a cultivated laziness or fear of authority or simply indifference, we convince ourselves, I know. Attention is about being very honest, very, very honest. Do I really know what is happening right now as I am watching this group of people, as I am walking past this market? As I am sitting with my friends? as I'm planning for my next activity, as I'm chatting with my wife, do I really know what is happening? That is attention. Hmm? Do I really know what is happening? That is attention. Hmm? Not faking it, not faking it. And in, in, in this attention, in this quality of the mind, there is no scope at all of for fear, right? There, how, how will you know? How will you ask? Right. How will you ask? Right. There is a fellow sitting in front of you and there is a strange look on his face. You are afraid that the fellow might beat you up if you ask him about that look. So what do you convince yourself? Oh, this look is nothing abnormal. Right. I know this look. You won't ask. You know nothing about where that look is coming from. But you have convinced yourself as if you know. This as if I know is the enemy of knowing. This assumption that I know is the enemy of knowing. But why don't you ask? Because you are afraid of something. We conclude. Hmm. A sixth grader is afraid. If he'll ask a question, the teacher might snub him. The peers might laugh at him. And we have all been through those experiences. Those experiences have sunk very deep in our psyche. Hmm? You have 
made a very central point. With fear, there is no possibility of attention. In fact, inattentive people must know that they are afraid of something. Right, because the form in which fear appears to us is the same as that which is the enemy of attention, thought, right? So fear always comes to you in the form of thought and thought is the enemy of attention. Like thought ensures that you don't enter into attention. Anything more on this? So in many of the last discourses, in many of the discourses today also, uh, you have been speaking, coming close to anything, coming very close to anything. Uh, what exactly does it mean to come very close? To not to imagine. In this world, whenever you come close to something, what you discover is the facts and coming close requires a particular quality which is not factual. A woman is weeping. A woman is weeping. When you go close to her and you inquire, why are you weeping? Hmm? You have been through such an incident, so I am quoting this one. When you go close to her and inquire, why are you weeping? What you come to know is the facts. But going close, see facts are worldly. When you go close to her and inquire, why are you weeping? She'll tell you something which is of this world, right? She'll say she has been mistreated or she has lost something or something. Whatever she will quote will belong to this world. But that within you which enabled you to go close, if closeness is real, is not something of this world. But this is going close. Go and inquire the fact, which is a very material thing. But knowing the material is not a property of the material. So in knowing the material, you are actually activating something which is not material. And only material can be known using these eyes and this brain and this body. What else can be known? Hmm? Know the material. That knowing is the essence of spirituality. In fact, at some point, materialism and spirituality are so very one. Hmm? Being fearful or fearless, it's all depend on living with the conscious mind. Or attentive. If you live with the conscious mind, not conscious. What you usually call as consciousness is just more mental activity. It's just more thoughtfulness. There's a difference between consciousness and attentiveness. In worldly matters, Thinking more helps. But when it comes to matters of the mind, then thinking more is not a help, but a hindrance. What do you mean by conscious? When do you say somebody is conscious? When you can think and perceive, that's when you say somebody is conscious, right? Attention is not about thinking and perceiving, it is something else. 
Whatever you will think will not be bigger than you, beyond you. Your thought is your thought. That is why thoughts are different from people to people. Consciousness, your consciousness cannot be bigger than you. Attention is beyond you. Consciousness can be taken away. Consciousness can be modified. Consciousness can be stuffed. You can be made to think a few things. That's what all advertisers do, don't they? They attack your consciousness and they <coughs> warp your consciousness. Consciousness is just the stuff that is there in the mind coming from here and there. We are not talking of consciousness here, we are talking of attention. Do not confuse these two words. I understand there are a lot of people who sing the virtues of consciousness. Not consciousness. Consciousness is... We are anyway conscious. Hmm? We are talking of knowing consciousness itself. See, what does it mean to be conscious? To be conscious means there is something on the TV and I am able to watch the TV, right? That is consciousness. And I am able to interpret what the fellow is saying. He is motivating me to go and buy a new pair of shoes. You will say the fellow is conscious. If I am able to perceive this much, you will say I am conscious, right? In fact, quite conscious. But being able to watch the television and being able to be influenced by the television and go out and buy a pair of shoes, this exact, this entire process does not make me attentive. Attention is to know the reality of this entire process. What is happening? Okay, so in consciousness one watches the, sub, the object gets affected, acts, builds up a residue, acts further. This is attention. Of course, attention is not the statements that I just made, but the knowing. <coughs> Do you get the difference between attention and consciousness? Somebody puts tasty food in front of you. You smell the food. Hmm? This is consciousness. If you are unconscious, you will not smell. You immediately feel grateful to the person. This is consciousness. You say thank you. This again is consciousness. Etiquette that is coming from. Your mouth starts salivating. This again is consciousness. Certain thoughts start coming to you, that again is consciousness. But none of this is attentiveness. Attentiveness is to know the functioning of consciousness itself. To be more conscious would be to be able to smell food all the more strongly and to be able to recognize even the most subtle of aromas that does not make you attentive. Hmm? Somebody is able to say that you know from the smell itself I can say that all these ingredients are present in the food. The fellow is quite conscious, but it tells nothing about his attentiveness. 
किसी को थोड़ा और ब्रॉड कैनवास पे देखें तो जो लोग हम लोग जो भी कर रहे हैं यहाँ बैठे हैं तो ये मैसेज था ये कॉन्शियस माइंड है कि कॉन्शियस माइंड के जैसे बैठे हैं चीज़ें को कोशिश कर रहे हैं फियरनेस ये कैसे तो लोग आते हैं फियरफुल कैसे हो जाए बाकी अनकॉन्शियस माइंड की वजह से या तीन तल है अनकॉन्शियस भी बोल दिया था दैट यू आर हियरिंग मी इज कॉन्शियसनेस हियरिंग सो फ्रॉम माई थ्रोट अ पर्टिकुलर साउंड वेव इज ट्रेवलिंग एंड यू आर हियरिंग फिजिकली हियरिंग इट इज हिडिंग हिटिंग योर इयर ड्रम अ पर्टिकुलर इलेक्ट्रिकल मैसेज इज गोइंग टू योर ब्रेन दैट इज कॉन्शियसनेस No, there is not attention. Then the complete process. No, then your mind mysteriously settles down and down and down and relaxes. This relaxed mind, this mind purified of rubbish. is the quality of attention consciousness is to attention what hearing is to listening consciousness is just a happening you cannot justify your do anything with respect to it if i am speaking you will hear you don't have a choice in this but listening is a different matter altogether and being unconscious would only mean being in a different stage of consciousness are you getting it there is nothing actually called being unconscious suppose you fall asleep then you will not be able to even hear what i am saying right but i will not say that you are unconscious some people might say that this fellow has gone unconscious so it is not really being unconscious it is just a different state of consciousness you may even faint and then you will not be able to listen to me you won't even hear even that fainting is a different state of consciousness don't call it being unconscious when people talk of consciousness one great assumption false assumption that they make is as if the waking state of consciousness is the only state of consciousness at least the only legitimate state of consciousness sleeping they don't even take as consciousness so when you say somebody is consciousness is somebody is conscious what you mean is that he is awake people will find it very strange if you show them a sleeping person and say that he is conscious they say but he is sleeping how can he be conscious sleeping is just another state there is nothing called being unconscious consciousness has various states man ke hazar rang that is consciousness and that drunkard is by the way very conscious quite conscious very conscious he becomes in fact in a in a sense he becomes more conscious after drinking you see if to if to really see things is consciousness then the drunkard sees 20 fingers where you see 10 you only see a woman when there is a woman he sees 50 women when there is none he is more conscious attention is not consciousness hmm 
setting attention you are also conscious you can of course of course see attentively you would be watching some state of consciousness attention is the center around which the game of consciousness is played hmm? attention is the center around which the game of consciousness is played so when you do the word you are going to do the game with attention to be here I so, think so I would like to bring back the same old discussion because that uh, again I would like to ask about what is being closed. We we have a gawk outside. We have a rabbit there, plants outside, people here inside outside, and I feel like being closed because I hear this word closed, and the image that I make probably is the physical closeness, and and I somewhere know it's not the right way of closeness. So how is it really to be close to anybody, or even to ourselves, or to a situation? And physical closeness is required to an extent. You have to spend time with the plants. You have to go and touch the tree. You cannot sit here, fascinating about the tree, and yet claim closeness with it. Hmm? But that does not mean that everybody who is sitting under the tree is close to the tree. It is a necessary but not a sufficient condition. So physical closeness to an extent is required. Closeness means being open to the fact that it is. And not being so arrogant as to come to a conclusion about what it is Good. you are there you are but i am not going to be so arrogant as to give you a name with all my might i will say you are but never will i say what you are because if i say what you are then closeness is finished now i do not require to be close anymore i have come to a conclusion conclusion is an ending ending of closeness i already know what you are what will i do by remaining further close finished that is closeness you are wonderful lovely and with a quality beyond me the more i know of you the more i discover that there is more to be known hmm? that is coming close coming close does not mean coming close to a deadline to a finish point coming close is like entering an immensity you enter it and you keep on entering it it's a succession of enterings agree it's not about a runner approaching the finish line so you can really never call it closeness you can only call it closer 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 closerness hmm? but if you come to a conclusion then closeness will become closedness so don't let it become closedness hmm? never claim that i know what this plant is or i know what this bird is or what that rabbit is you will never know and it's great that you will never know hmm? don't even aspire to ever fully know there is nothing called full knowledge 
there is only full ignorance that is the image you draw when we hear this word knowing i mean as if you have completely mm. got something mm -hmm. knowing is never 100% power is so closely associated with knowledge right when you say i know something yes i know it yes i said arrogance right knowledge and power are so intricately yes. connected yes. in the terms we we use knowledge yes that you gain power yes for instance i know what is going on in your mind right i have power over you i have power over you So, okay, it was really a beautiful discussion. So, I hope there are no more questions to be asked on fear. I think uh, it couldn't have been a better exploration of what fear is and how it is real related to freedom. <coughs> right? So, we talked about the Upanishads, we talked about modern uh, seers, saints, and in a long journey, we explored how phys physical fear, psychological fear, biological fear, how they are all related. to the objective world around us and shri prashant very very uh, lucidly conveyed to all of us how <clears throat> fear basically resides in the object and also in consciousness and uh, like so so attention is the word that 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 will bring us to fearlessness and for that we have to go close to fear and be attentive to what is around us so uh, uh, thanks a lot shri prashant it was really my nice. pleasure thank you